Welcome to the English Department Speaker Series for 2009. Um, our first speaker this year is Sandy Baldwin, who is Associate Professor of English at West Virginia University, where he also directs the Centre for Literary Computing. Uh, Dr. Baldwin's scholarly work explores media technologies as rhetorical and aesthetic objects and asks how media structure our thought and experience. Um, he's one of the organisers of the International E-Poetry Festival. Last year he was a recipient of National Science Foundation funding for a workshop on computer code and creative writing. Um, he's also a creative writer and an artist. He works in text, video, code and in online environments such as Second Life. And he wins my vote for the best title names of his projects, which include Avatar Paste and Code Soup, and my all-time favorite, Spiritual Turkey Beggar Based Mechanism, a screenplay for Kung Fu Opera. Huh. Um, and Dr. Baldwin's <laughs> talk today is entitled Logging In and Getting Off, Login, Labor, and Literature at the Interface of the Digital Subject. Thank you, Han. Thank, thanks, Helen Burgess, and thanks to everybody at, at UMBC for um, inviting me here. I haven't been here before, and it's a uh, tremendous campus. I'm really pleased to be here. I apologize for the technical difficulties. I, you know, amazingly, my own brought my own laptop, brought a data stick, and my file is still corrupted. But I found everything I needed on the on the net, and so I'm going to talk through just a few things that will supplement. Um, although, you know, I may miss one or two things, um, and I'm essentially going to read a talk. Um, because I because I, I tend to think performatively, I tend to write the talk and then read it directly, but you can stop me and raise your hand, or you can ask questions at the end, okay? And I'll try to work with the stuff I've got on the screen. Let me cite, uh, in a posthumous fragment, Sigmund Freud writes, psyche is extended, knows nothing about it. Let me state, I write away, as in wear away, one drifting piece of our inhabitation of the net, writing away through myself and towards myself and in lieu of myself, writing as weapon and spew and nothing. Let me ask, how many times a day do you do it? Once, twice, seven, 18, 50? Are your hands tired? Are your fingers calloused? We all do it. it. It is at least a shared experience, more or less habitual, our fingers finding the way automatically. What is it? I'm writing on the knot of logging the subject of the net. Let me admit, we all do it, and yet it is hard to describe. What is log on like? It's difficult to find analogies or reading remediations for logon from other media forms. For example, if logon seems similar to the signature, to the inscription and circulation of proper names, say in publications or accounting books, it differs because I inhabit logon. I'm told you must be logged in to do that. I not only represent myself online, but act through logon. Is represent even adequate here? Can we think logon in terms of a singular and situated subject who logs on to a network, the subject who's over here and who logs on to a network over there? Logon is not simple. Is it not a science fiction scenario of being elsewhere, loaded into a computer? We must acknowledge its fundamental oddness, the oddness of logging on to something. You, set, you may set up a machine to log in automatically, say I'm powering the system up, and you may set it to log out automatically. You may also physically log out by turning off the machine, which differs from the protocol of logging out of an account. You can also be logged in or logged on, but not there. You can log in and go away to have some coffee or go to sleep. You may also log on to several accounts and split yourself across the net. It's a question of who or what logs on or is logged on. Am I logged on? Yes, I'm logged on. No, it logs on. It is logged on. And to, to these questions, I'm going to propose three formulas about log on. Number three is as follows. Log in me more than me. Or as Freud quotes a patient, it shot through me. There was something in me at that moment that was stronger than me. So here I'm suggesting log on is a kind of occupation of a, of a space of otherness that is already haunting us. And I'll try to elaborate that at length towards the end of this. The second formula is a bit easier. I differentiate log on, so two words, and I have a wonderful slide for this, but log on, two words, which is the action or verb, right? I log on to a, a, a network or computer. From log on, one word, which is the state or mode of being online, right? I'm logged on. The action requires a story of log on, a narrative and an accounting, and it comes down to accounting of the labor of login. Log on is necessary because of accountancy. You log on and you begin to spend resources. The differential between log on and off is a condition of capitalization. The meter is running as you surf the net, even if you don't notice it. With this in mind, the second formula echoes Neuromancer style. Log in as jack in, and this is in Neuromancer, right? There's the jack in that jacks you into the net, and jacking off, getting off the net. 
The labor of logon is a matter of putting to work excessive affect and surplus pleasure, of mobilizing body parts at the interface, of the productivity of organs that are donated to but never delivered to the net. Still ahead of myself, Formula One, the first, the first of the three formulas, I've given the other two, here's the first one. Log on is part of writing myself into the net. This first formulaic statement makes log on a project of being and presence on the net, of construal and working through the net's otherness, where the net is always on, as defined in the RFC number one, the very first of the internet requests for communications. If you're not familiar with these, these were documents that formulated what the internet would be. They're essentially um, uh, administrative protocol documents that, that define the internet at the moment, at, at the very time it was being created. And the very first of these defines the network as always on, as, as, as always in a state of on, no matter if there's only a single node on the internet network. And this was a document written in 1967 when the internet first came into existence. All that the net nets is smoothed and purified. You may log on to a Unix system, and the Unix shell executes files called .login and .cshrc, or something similar, depending on the version of Unix. These files contain your protocols, your profile. They determine your permission to access other parts of the system. They determine your home directory, your editor, your printer, and so on. Logon authenticates you to the system and supplies your username with necessary levels of credentials to interact with the system. Logon is tied to permission to a protocol that recognizes and places a proper name. I present my papers, own up to my name, and ask for my identity be, to be validated. So my point is, with this third, uh, the three formulas, the first one I tied to pleasure um, and to, um, to a kind of displacement of the self. The second formula I tied to accountancy and to labor. And this third formula I tied Logon to uh, a, a writing of myself into an online environment that's defined by protocols, that's defined by objects that are, def that are circumscribed by internet protocols, and that's defined by the circulation of proper names. And I'm going to talk about each of these um, in, in, in the rest of the paper. Logon is productive. What does this mean? First, logon is produced. It is a performance framed by institutional and technical parameters. I log in as a persona or an avatar. The name I assume when I log in is never my own name, even if it is mine. I may, you may, I may say that my login, S. Baldwin, is my name, but it's never the name that I'm given. It's a, it's a name that the system gives me. Login is fictional and generates a narrative knot that unfolds through my being online. Login is tied to the problem of digital literature. Login is produced, but it also produces. It requires the presentation of a working body. It produces work, digital work, work characterized by the problem of the work. The concept of logging on emerges from measuring work. Most histories refer to clocking in, the procedure of tracking hours worked by punching the clock. The worker arrives at a factory used and used a, uh, used a time card to track the beginning and end of work. The card was put in a slot and stamped for the official time. This is the tradition of punching the clock at the factory. The Bundy manufacturing company, the inventor and earliest manufacturer of time clocks, was later incorporated into the computing tabulating recording company, which in turn became International Business Machines, or IBM, in 1924. So the point is that IBM began its business making time clocks for workers in factories, and later moved into making computers. And I, I'm, I'm fortunate the PowerPoint that I somehow got corrupted when I came down here. I had some pictures of these time clocks, which essentially looked like grandfather clocks, um, you know, so they're a timekeeping piece that had a place where you could stick in the punch card and get it punched. You would, you would clock in. IBM's website, in fact, still maintains documentation if you, on how to maintain, you know, alongside their, their, their you know, information about laptops and other computers, maintains archival documentation on how to set a time clock. The scarce resources of early computer systems implemented the notion of logging on as a similar accounting, similar to clocking in, for a time on and off the system. Log on as creation of a stock of labor and as measured accountancy of net time is never far away. As both production of the self and excessive display of otherness, and this is my, the two parts here, this notion of excessive pleasure and uh, the notion of log on as production that I'm trying to um, set out here in my, my, my formulas about log on. In these two, in these, both these ways, Log on is captured and canalized, uh, directed, channeled in a milieu or apparatus of captcha. And I'm going to talk then in a, for a large chunk of my presentation here about captcha, which is, there's some captcha. You're familiar with captcha even if you don't recognize the name. Everybody's seen these, right? Anybody not seen these? These are the words, phrases, or occasionally numbers which you are required to recognize and type into forms on websites in order to gain permission for an account or to post to a site. 
Um, you know, I've got, you know, again, I, I just grabbed a few examples because my, my little PowerPoint wasn't working, but you're probably familiar with these, right? Capture now everywhere on the net. Examples of words and phrases collected over the last few days by me, Lacking Katrina, Animal Brothers, Bellarmine Dunn, Smiley Uri, St. Chapin, Season Bambrick, M. Denounces, and Quiv Hag, Vivk Dokkov. <laughs> Capture is a program that runs every time the page is loaded into the browser and displays new combinations of letters or words chosen according to a procedure. It selects a word from a dictionary or generates a pseudo word like smum or swum. It then uses Gimpy or some other program to distort the fonts and other features, right? They're, they're both, they've been folded some, with the goal of preventing computerized image recognition. The letters are twist, twisted and warped, crossed with visual noise such as dots or hashing, and washed out with wildly varying colors. You've probably seen these ones too. And my point here, I'm going to connect, I'm going to suggest that CAPTCHA is part of this large, this other more general phenomenon of logging into the network. There are different genres of capture. For example, Facebook tends to have curious phrases. Google has interesting words and so on. They're essentially determined by the stochastic process used. Now remember, stochastic refers to a process that unfolds non-deterministically, where the relation between a moment and a series, or between inputs and outputs, appears random, complex, and multiply determined. So in the case of generating a, a, a phrase here, choosing the first letter, as the program chooses the letter, say the letter S, the, the second letter would then be, is in effect chosen by some sort of random process that creates the random spring, string. Some CAPTCHA programs stochastically produce strings of letters that do not approximate any English language series of symbols like this. They do not resemble words at all. Others produce a series where the letters and digraphs or letter pairs approximate English language. And you could say, for example, the, the digraph SM is close to the, you know, we have letter, words like that. Right? that begin with that smear and so on. Okay, so some produce where series of letters or digraphs approximate English language. Others produce phrases in a similar way, while some capture program produce phrases from words existing in the language, but paired in a stochastic manner. The result is an unexpected, but not impossible phrase. So for example, I talked about having, you know, some of the, the ones that I, when I logged in earlier this week, I got lacking Katrina or animal brothers, which are both um, English language words, but the phrase is, is uncommon and unlikely. CAPTCHA is an enormous distributed writing machine. It inscribes writing to be read and rewritten in a constant, incalculable flow across the net. Where else is there such a repeated engagement with a language-oriented, avant-garde, non-semantic text production? And this is what first struck me and why I, I, I'm writing about CAPTCHA, in that you have, when you, if you think of the sum of these CAPTCHA texts that are produced on the net, um, it's an enormous textual corpus that's constantly being um, inscribed, displayed, rewritten by people, and then essentially disappearing. Capture relates in a direct but problematic way to contemporary writing practices and to practices of digital literature. This is especially so as the computer increasingly provides writers new fields of visual and stochastic text production. The lower order capture, lower order where stochastic processes offer dense strings unrecognizable as English words. So again, smum or, see if I can do this here. You know, well, here, here we've got you know, following finding. That's, that's, those are close enough to English words that you can see they've been distorted. Or here, these are, this is what I mean by lower order. These are, you know, clops, three, you know. These appear similar to sound poetry or concrete poetry. This visual poetry or vispo connection is reinforced by the combination of words with distortion, positioning in space, color, and non-linguistic elements. So the twisting relates it to visual poetries of various sorts. Another direction also articulated with concrete poetry is the strain of visual and conceptual art uh, that works with scripts at the edge of readability and recognition. I'm thinking here of, for example, Henry Flint, who uh, is a visual, uh, uh, early uh, member of Fluxus and other concept art groups who works, uh, did a series of works called the Counting Stands, which create uh, visual artifacts that are, are somewhere between numbers and letters, and, and the artwork is about how we perceive those and how we try to count or not count or make them into something readable or not. In turn, the higher order capture, the ones that, that are, are readable as words, um, 
this, well, and finding the higher order capture that utilizes phrases and possibly even regular English words, approximates language poetry and other strains of avant-garde contemporary poetics with its semantic play and asyntactic construction. Take a look at the dense pseudo-language of David Melnick's Poet. That's P-C-O-E-T. It was a book that Melnick wrote, um, again, of a kind of um, strings of t strings of letters and, and phrases that never quite approximate English words, always fall below the readability of the English language, but suggest something that's close to a language. So looking at David Melnick's Poet, uh, a well-known piece of contemporary poetry, or reading Bruce Andrews' I Don't Have Any Paper, So Shut Up, which is another um, uh, recent uh, avant-garde po uh, poetry text with its humorous but seemingly found phrases such as cheerful robots and garage guilt, and both read as collections possibly of captured texts. What's the purpose of CAPTCHA? CAPTCHA is informed by a basic cryptographic principle. It proves you are who you are by making a challenge that forces you to manifest a response that only you can have. You're hailed and called. You must respond, and not ju with just any response, but a specific one. In the case of cryptography, the response is the key that you employ to decrypt the message. But in the case of CAPTCHA, it is some task that humans can perform regularly and machines cannot. Now, one possibility of such a test on the system, on a computer, is to pose a challenging question. But questions such as, what's the date today, or a mathematical puzzle, are tough to generate for a computer on a, over and over again, and are relatively simple to break. A, 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 a spam bot or an artificial intelligence program can respond to what is the date today. The ideal question for, um, for doing one of these CAPTCHA tests are questions that are not cognitive. They don't involve looking up information in your memory. And we all know that computers look up information faster and with far greater resources than we do, than humans do. Any computer on the net can randomly guess and generate, uh, generate guesses of CAPTCHA responses in the hope of a brute force breaking of the, the tests. Even more, one of the paradoxes of CAPTCHA is that the computer running it must know the answer to the puzzle, since it must be able to look up the answer to evaluate the test. In other words, right, even though the test is trying to determine that the person logging in is a human and not a computer, the paradox is that the computer running the program needs to be able to look up the answer in order to evaluate that I've, in fact, passed the test. To summarize, Louis von Ahn, who's one of the researchers on CAPTCHA, CAPTCHA generates and grades a test that it itself cannot pass. Inversely and paradoxically, humans can take the test and not pass, but still make the grade. That is, we continue to be human even if we don't pass. And I'm going to talk at some length about this, but it's a paradox, right, that, um, that it's designed to prevent uh, a, a computer from logging in and to allow humans to log in. But if I don't get it right, it allows me to do it again because it wants me, wants me as a human to be on there. So on the one hand, uh, the computer can't pass the test. On the other hand, I can fail the test, but I get to keep doing it until I truly pass because um, I'm, I'm, I'm human and it wants me to assert my humanness. And what would it mean for us to fail the test? Can we fail to be human? What unsurmountable and unfailing quality is always there that it's testing for? The testing never stops. We cannot fail, yet we're never allowed to finally pass. The test is everywhere, in a sense, all, everywhere on the net. Think of spam with an embedded image, perhaps trying to sell you Viagra. The spam image is not caught by the email filter, which only can recognize text-based spam. But you open your email, and you see the image. Once again, you're faced with a CAPTCHA test. You recognize it. You may or may not respond, but it calls to you. And the same is true of any image on the net. Any image on the net we, we, we recognize. So the images on the net are, well, part of the argument I'm making is the Im images on the net are intended for human eyes. Spammer relies on the fact that humans perceive to read, whereas the email filter only parses patterns of text. Now, of course, a CAPTCHA is always susceptible to being broken by programs for image processing. And the original techniques for coming up with CAPTCHA, for distorting them and so on, um, are based on problems in image processing and problems in when you scan a, an image uh, and try to do optical character recognition. And sophisticated programs can find a way to sort through the visual distortion and recognize the image. And the result is a kind of arms race where spammers and the rest continually develop new programs better able to keep to beat CAPTCHAs. Such programs beat the test by gridding the image, by breaking it into pieces, clustering <laughs> elements, and trying to solve each cluster. So the, the spammer tries to recognize the text by breaking the visual into a, a raster through a process of segmentation and then altering the grain of the raster until there's a recognizable solution, looking for contours, colors, adjacencies, edges, textures that might then lead to a, a readable text. 
not a matter then of recognition for the co computer program that breaks up the image, but of graphable regions. The, the computer program medicalizes the visual into a cluster of symptoms. By contrast, the, captcha, the concept of CAPTCHA assumes recognition of significant images as proper to the human. I mean, I'm, I'm arguing here that there's a notion, and I'm going to elaborate so, some, some examples of that. There's a notion the designers of the CAPTCHA assume that we recognize in a different way that we recognize um, holes, uh, whole, you know, uh, gestalt holes, and we recognize in an instant. The assumption ties CAPTCHA to a practice of a certain kind of being that, that, that argues that humans um, exist in a certain way and perceive the world in a certain way. It assumes some interiority, some inner structure of humans, and responsibility, in other words, that we will um, you know, exercise that, that our humanness in identifying these images. At the same time, the event of recognition, the, the, the event where I recognize this and perceive it, and my responsibility for doing that is elusive and ever receding, by which I mean Again, that if I fail it, I might fail it, but I get to keep taking the test till I pass it. So um, there, there's a kind of, um, uh, on the one hand, it's supposed to be an authentic demonstration of the fact that I recognize these images. On the other hand, the uh, recognition can be delayed, can be uh, misconstrued. And I'm going to talk at, at, at some more about this. The affinities to literary production do not let us qualify CAPTCHA as literary writing in a vague sense that everything is potential literature. My point's not in drawing affinities between this and contemporary uh, uh, experimental poetry that you know, anything on the net can be literature, but rather that I see this problem of recognition and manifestation of, of uh, interiority and recognition as tied to um, the appearance of the literal and uh, the appearance of the literary um, from the literality, the literalness of any system, so the becoming literary of the literal, in the commerce between human activity, human perception, and machine techniques. Recognition of CAPTCHA operates with a common sense concept of the equivalence of an external object with an idea already contained in the mind of a singular individual. Such a concept is the outcome and image of recognition. In what follows, I situate inventive production. So um, I'm going to argue that um, in that act of recognition, there's a kind of inventive, inventiveness, inventive production. And I'm going to continue to suggest also that this involves a kind of display, um, display of the human. Um, and, and I'm going to suggest that this display exceeds any kind of sense of uh, that, we, that, that what basically what's involved is just recognizing the image. Um, and in the background of some of this is, is work on animal display and camouflage um, and, um, and a, range of, of, uh, a range of theories on, on, on how, um, uh, how phenomena work. Telling humans and computers apart feeds several channels of desire into and on the net. First desire. To ensure that humans are nodes sighted in the net, nodes that can make promises and so become signs producing work. The filtering of humans from programs with the goal of ensuring that only an authenticated human is logged on also maintains a model of the consumer. It, cons it construes the consumer as a sight or unitary subject with a finite repertoire of desires and tastes codified in the user profile or login information. This construal is tied to CAPTCHA's initial appearance, the Alta Vista search engine <coughs> began using CAPTCHA around 1997 or so, claiming it helped prevent spam bots from automatically submitting URLs to, to the search engine. CAPTCHA also appeared at about the same time in the Yahoo chat rooms, where more and more bots were entering into the chat. Both sites are commercial in origin. The bots and chat rooms are intended to bring people to consumer sites, just as are the URLs in Alta Vista. CAPTCHA is not just a differentiation of human and machine, but also a differentiation of consumer and marketer. The creator of web-based ads, which are still a, a, a primary, perhaps the primary, online way of drawing people to online businesses, requires humans to see their ads and desire their products and respond through purchasing. CAPTCHA controls flows of desire and regulates accelerated incentivization of eyeballs and click-throughs. CAPTCHA also channels desires to create communality. The networking claims of Web 2.0 require investment and circulation of signifiers of human sociality, ranging from Facebook updates to Twitter tweets on what you're doing right now, all in order to create relations between users. So my point is that Web 2.0 phenomena, whether it's Facebook or Flickr and so on, um, require the notion that our interactions with that are investments of, you know, our desires, our our interests, right? That 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 when I update things in Twitter, I really am updating it. I'm not just making it up. And that's an interesting kind of fictional problem there. So uh, the networking claims require the idea that these are signifiers of human sociality. 
the direction and outcome of these, so these signifiers are, is various. I mean, it may be leveraged for marketing, just as well the Web 1.0 model. Or the Web 2.0 uh, applications may be in the service of more utopian goals. In either case, spam bot postings that CAPTCHA seeks to prevent arguably do not contribute to communality, whereas human eyes on Web 2.0 content creates loyalty to the site and participation in the social network. So my point here is that not just the commercial goal, but also the idea that if I, if I, um, if I have nothing but um, spammers posting things on my, webs on my, my blog or, or my Facebook account, it reduces the, the claims that my Facebook account is a site for uh, emerging communities on the web. Computer and information scientists researching stochastic text production refer to captions and the spam is intended to prevent as inauthentic text, that is writing produced by a computer that appears to be written by a human. And the research on inauthentic text works with a notion of a simulacrum of surface meaning or an appearance of authenticity built on an underlying lack of authenticity or meaninglessness. Inauthentic text is syntactically correct sentences such that the text as a whole is not meaningful. And this is a quote from the proceedings of the Sixth International Conference on Data Mining. So this notion of in inauthentic text, um, it's being, you know, for example, there's research done at Indiana University which is focused on statistical measures for detecting inauthenticity and authenticity in a text. And I think a related kind of thing is, is the um, plagiarism software like Turnitin, I don't know if you have Turnitin here, which uh, we have this at my university, which automatically generates a measure of originality in a text by kind of parsing through how the language has been used. In all these cases, there's a kind of taken for granted re um, relation between the um, human, being human on the one hand, and, our, and an articulation of surface depth and meaning on the other. And the notion here is that humans produce texts that are meaningful no matter how apparently nonsensical they may appear on the surface. And this is the notion of authenticity, right? That, that, um, and I, I argue that this, is a, this results in a kind of collapse of the authentication of a signature, right? That might say, I'm human, I produce a text because I, I sign it, right? With the semantic value of a text, the text might be meaningful, but not clearly signed, right? I might have a text that that's clearly has meaning, but it's not clear who the author is. And the notion of inauthentic text collapses these two. So the researchers in inauthentic text at the University of Indiana and elsewhere failed to recognize that the CAPTCHA text, the point of the CAPTCHA text is not the semantics of the text that authenticates, but the writing, rewriting, and repetition of the text, the fact that I write it in again. I want to pause a second. Here. It's so that the point with the captured text is not the semantics, not the meaning of this, right? That, that's part of the point, that it's a meaningless string, but the rewriting and repetition. Although there are ways that this iteration does frame the text semantically, from the emptiness of authentication through rewriting, it is this repetition, this efficacy, the, the, the rewriting of the text, this project of a series of, base, of excessive, excessive repetitions that makes CAPTCHA part of login, and I'm going to talk, talk um, in a minute then on how this is, is leveraged for work. Now the basic claim of CAPTCHA, let me gloss to the basic claim of CAPTCHA, is captured in the name that forms the acronym, right? CAPTCHA, I, I don't have the slide up for it, but it's C-A-P-T-H-A, stands for Completely Automated Public Turing Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. I'm going to talk in a second what, what a Turing Test is, but I'll say that again, Completely Automated public Turing test to tell humans and compu computers and humans apart. Now the translation of the Turing test into an online challenge and response system to deal with spam occurs in a paper called Verification of a Human in the Loop, or Identification via Turing Test, a paper by Moni Naur of the Wiseman Institute of Science. And the CAPTCHA acronym is developed later at Carnegie Mellon, but what's in this name, this Turing name? For starters, what's a Turing test? As you all probably know, it was originally de described in Alan Turing's 1950 article computing machinery and human intelligence. Turing is credited with designing a computational machine that broke the German Enigma codes during the Second World War and subsequently with the development of the Mark I, one of the first computers. Now let me describe a version, if you're not familiar with it, let me describe a version of the Turing test with more recent media. You engage in exchange of emails or instant messages or Facebook updates. Is the unknown respondent, the person you're emailing with or texting with, is it a computer or is it a bot? Or is it a person or is it a bot? Is it a person or is it a computer? You want to know, right? You wonder, is it someone 
uh, is it someone actually, pa uh, someone actually responding to you? Is it a computer program passing as a person? Based only on the conversation, can you judge whether the other is a human or a machine? Is there something in what is said or how it's said that differentiates people from programs? If this, if this were a version of the Turing test, if we take it as a version of the Turing test, then passing the test is when you are consistently unable to tell whether the other person, whether the other is a person or a machine. For the other to pass the test, whether machine or person, it means you're consistently unable to tell. And, and that, for Turing, that means you would recognize intelligence on the other end, whether it's a machine or a person. Now, despite many other attempts at models of, of computer intelligence, the Turing test remains a standard for computing machinery and human intelligence. Now, the CAPTCHA, as I indicated from the acronym that, that was uh, coined for it, is a Turing test for a human filling out the form. It's designed to fail machines attempting the test. Note that while Turing casts his test as a question of intelligence, remember the essay title is Computing Machinery and Human Intelligence, his test is not really an epistemological question of whether a machine can know and how much, but an ontological question of what kind of intelligence a machine can have and whether it can be the same kind humans can have, where intelligence becomes a measure of existence. Once again, remember in, in, in the CAPTCHA test, the computer knows the answer to the test. It must know it in order to evaluate it, but it cannot pass the test. Turing ties the existence question to a good enough imitation of the human we can say imitation of, of what, right? What does it mean to imitate the human? And for Turing, humans too, we too must create a good enough imitation of ourselves to convince others that we're human. This is what being human is, is producing, uh, you know, paradoxically, imitations that pass as human. In fact, what distinguishes being human is this imitation. And perhaps this is not so paradoxical, since it's the same kind of strange loop of logic that you have in, in Descartes, for example, right? Where I think, therefore I am, means that the Cartesian thing that thinks, thinks itself thinking and therefore thinks, and, and so on. Uh, keep in mind that this problematic of imitation, dissimulation, and masquerade is predicated on the symbolics of the name. The imitative auto-production of the human in the Turing test can be seen in variations of CAPTCHA. The CAPTCHA acronym, and now I'm going to talk about the acronym, the, the development of this CAPTCHA acronym was coined at, coined at Carnegie Mellon University by a number of computer scientists based on Nauer's proposal, the, the paper I talked about. The key figures here are Manuel Bloom and his student, Louis von Ahn, who I mentioned briefly earlier. Von Ahn actually patented the term CAPTCHA and sought to leverage the test to both solve a variety of computer science problems and to produce work, to produce labor. Adapting the concept of work expended through a computer's microprocessor, von Ahn sees our standard interactions with the net as wasted cycles. We play, waste time playing Minesweeper or World of Warcraft or surfing the net or downloading music. For von Ahn, we're just parasites on the net and should instead be in a, in a symbiotic relationship with the machine. The language of parasitology evokes the matrix where machines also evaluate humans as parasites in order to make use of us as batteries or power generators. And Von Ahn's cyborg position is similar. He seeks to convert the excessiveness of what I call human display that I've alluded to a number of times, this notion of human display, on the net from a series of intensities to sites of recognition and desire, the capture, and through this conversion to create productive and commodifiable flows and ultimately to create an abstract stock of net labor through log on. So let me give some examples. One account, one account by on estimates that existing CAPTCHA systems represent approximately 150,000 hours of labor per day that can be transparently tapped into. That's approximately 75 hours, 75 years of normal full-time work accomplished every day. So this is a, a notion that the labor of recognizing and retyping these things approximately Every day is like 75 years of work, human work. Consider the times, so consider the times, given this statistic, given this estimate, consider the time spent recognizing, and typing, and solving CAPTCHAs on the net. Why not make these productive and put CAPTCHAs to work? This is Von Ahn's notion. So now consider book digitization and scanning. Project Gutenberg, the oldest attempt to digitize full text of public domain books, adds approximately 50 new works per week. And Google Books reports scanning books at 1,000 pages an hour. At the same time, optical character recognition, or OCR, is imperfect, and the digital image is never the same as the text scan. Who can keep up with a proofreading? Von Ahn asks, how about CAPTCHA's distributed proofreading to resolve the bottleneck? So it works like this. Take a word that OCR software indicates is undetectable or in question, right? They scan a text, they come up with, the OCR software says, I can't recognize this word. I'm not sure what it is. Presented in a capture, maybe it's one of these words, following or finding. 
The word can be alone in the captured image, or there can be a combination of random strings and word to be proved. The human identifying and retyping the decontextualized word is, pr is proofreading. If several people type the same response to the word, it can be considered proofed. It is authenticated, and the computer can store the value of the word in the OCR text. The process requires linking the capture program to, partic uh, to particular locations via the net to make sure the work is coordinated. Right. So if I if I type in following finding, it then wants to suck those back to wherever the uh, the uh, text digitization is being done and insert it into the the digital text to make sure that the work is coordinated so that the word is supplied and the answer returned back to the proofreading location and so on. This conversion of the intensity of display into the institutional codification of desire and in turn into flows of productive labor is highlighted by the purported use of the method in websites with pornographic images. In this example, a word meaning proofreading is copied into the verification page of the porn site with the notion that people wanting to access porn are willing to type in a few measly words. In other words, they this is a kind of place where people are willing to produce labor. The desire for the porn images then crosses into the CAPTCHA image and propels the proofreading. The, the text is then copied back. This is purported. Nobody quite knows if this is actually being used in porn sites. The reCAPTCHA, more systematic approach, is uh, reCAPTCHA, which is Ron On's project here. And here's an example of this. This is the website for reCAPTCHA. Um, this is the one that's patented in Carnegie Mellon that I mentioned. Um, here are the results, a word, in this case, you can't quite see, but here's the, the scan text. You know, a computer scanned this text. The OCR software says it doesn't recognize this word. That word is then parceled out into a CAPTCHA somewhere else on the net. Someone types in, this is the word morning, and the, the other word upon. It, that, that result, morning, gets sent back to the, OCR, the people doing the OCR. If several people identify it, it's fine then it's counted as proof. The results are assembled in an e-book and submitted to Project Gutenberg. Automated, uh, and this automates existed distributed proofreading accounts. I mean, Gu Project Gutenberg is using a range of distributed proofreading methods, most of which require human labor rather than this kind of, this kind of um, combination of human and, and program, uh, combination of human and the capture program. Um, Project Gutenberg um, estimates that the distributed proofreading practices, including reCAPTCHA, have led to some 14,400 texts proofed as of February 3rd, 2009. As of last week, that was the number. Um, the first was one done in July 20, two, 2006, so that's 14,000 in a little less than three years. And more recently, Von Ahn began working on the related problem of labeling images with words. Most current image searching on the net looks for file names or requires humans to create labels. There's no reliable computer program that will process an image and label it with tags and other descriptions. In other words, there's no reliable computer program that will look at your image on Flickr and say it's an image of a dog. Right? It, computer programs just can't do this. Rather than manually create images for labels, Von Ahn created a game called Guap that employs capture-like image recognition and uses the results as labels. You and a partner see an image. So I'm, I'm, I log into this game on the web. Someone else somewhere else in, in wherever in Paris logs into the game. We both see the same image. Again, maybe it's a dog and we're asked to label it, cute dog, right? If you both give the same labels, you win the game, right? Following a certain number of wins on, a, on an image, the labels are stored and verified as correct. Again, the assumption is if, if, uh, if people log in and people produce the labels and there's agreement, it, it must be correct. Verification means a shared encounter and recognition within the specified domain of the image. The approach adopts Web 2.0 crowdsourcing and voting systems familiar from applications such as Flickr, which is essentially a vast system for labeling photos, and also techniques from applications such as Hot or Not or Rate Your Professor. Von Ahn claims 75,000 players so far, of whom who, uh, so far who created 15 million labels. He describes people playing the game over 20 hours a week, up to even 15 hours straight. At this rate, five, if, the, if, if he continues at this rate, Von Ahn predicts that 5,000 people playing for several weeks could label all the images on Google and soon all the images on the net. So this is an example of leveraging this CAPTCHA method as a kind of, uh, a kind of productive work. Or consider Amazon. Uh, consider the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Anybody familiar with this, Amazon Mechanical Turk? Consider the Amazon Mechanical Turk, built as a marketplace for work that requires human intelligence. This is part of Amazon's web services, where Amazon is creating a different, a diverse services separate from its uh, commercial marketplace. Rather than capture the workers or turkers 
produce human intelligence tasks or hits. As the website puts it, and here I'm quoting, humans are much more effective than computers at solving some types of problems, like finding specific objects in a picture, or evaluating beauty, or translating text. So these hits are essentially similar to the kind of CAPTCHA or Turing test tasks. Anyone can sign up as a Turker, you can all do it, and access the many tasks that Amazon brokers for companies who would traditionally have accomplished these tasks by hiring a large temporary workforce, which Amazon points out is time consuming, expensive, and difficult to scale. The result is an on-demand workforce to lower cost structure, which allows laying off traditionally employed workers. Most of the tasks are similar to captures, transcribing text, labeling images, and so on. So for uh, one I was looking at yesterday, if I were to go and um, I would see a, a, an object, uh, let's say a piece of hardware that's intended to be put in a, you know, a piece of a car or a piece of some other object, if I were to write a 25 word description of that, that would pay me five cents. Well, finding an image of a box of vitamins on a website pays me two cents. So these are these the typical hit tasks here. The tasks also include, now they've tried to do some things that maybe would seem to have um, larger and more aggregative, aggregative um, results. For example, they tried to do um, distributed searching of satellite data for missing persons. This was notably in the search for the aviator Steve Fossett, uh, when, you know, whose body was eventually found. They tried to use these Amazon Turkers to search the satellite photos, but um, it was fairly unsuccessful because it seemed to, the, the amount of um, time required to teach people to search satellite photos um, outweighed the kind of, co you know, the cost saving of the distributed workforce. Now critics see Amazon's Mechanical Turk as a virtual sweatshop. The workers are treated as contractors. There's not, you know, there's not a tax, I mean, the taxes aren't taken out of their labor so they have to take care of that. There's no minimum wage structure, there are no benefits. Now further, it's true that most of the hits are boring, repetitive, insulting to the intelligence, and pay literally pennies. Uh, you can work all day and earn less than two dollars, though it's possible to make a lot of money if you choose these things right. Yet, what makes a person a Turker? Perhaps to make money, but despite Amazon's rhetoric of the on-demand workforce, if you take a quick look at Turk Nation, for example, which is the community around Turking, it's clear that people pursue it for many reasons, including the thrill and distraction of solving problems as much as making money. In short, they do it um, to, for the purpose of display and, and log on, and the pleasure of display and log on, and that's gonna be where I'm going with, the, with most of the rest of the paper, to get the, it's the intensity that one gets in CAPTCHA. I'm trying to focus in on, uh, you know, so I suggested that the repetition, the rewriting in CAPTCHA, on the one hand produces a kind of, is, is a kind of productivity or labor. I'm also suggesting, as I said at the beginning, that it's tied to affect and pleasure. Now the Turing test, the Turing test that produces to distinguish human and computer, to give you the privilege of asserting your humanness and unique human identity, offers a Cartesian closure where I discover myself in a circuit through the machine. Uh, Jacques Lacan once wrote that when I turn on an electric light, there's no response but my own desire. Now, I, I'm going to argue with this argument about pleasure and affect, but the truth is elsewhere, that in logging on, we traverse an apparatus that distinguishes potentials across a field of different intensities and pleasures, and that we then produce a discourse naming these potentials as human and machines, different <coughs> sites in the machine. Now, keep in mind the CAPTCHA method is not limited to words and phrases. It could be used on any symbol, or including images, as we've seen. Anything can be the object of the recognition and intensity of a CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA is a writing machine that never stops writing and rewriting everything into symbolic orders. Turing's 1929 paper, earlier paper, the one that uh, led to the digital computer, is called On Computable Numbers, conceived of the computer as just such a reading, writing machine, where a paper with a written symbol passes before a reading head or eye that notes the symbol, stores the symbol, and operates on it. The symbols must be discrete, in order to be grasped in a glance by the reading head. In turn, any discrete symbol, anything symbolizes anything that can be symbolized discreetly, any chain of discrete symbols that, any, that a set of symbols can be a part of, any of these are computable by, by the Turing machine, the, this, this uh, reading head and, and string of paper. And the game of 20 years later treats humans and machines as similarly discrete and computable, insofar as both produce discourse as chains of discrete symbols. In other words, again, the, Turing te the, the capture requires me to um, e produce my humanness in a, in a, in a discrete, um, constrained moment of recognition. A computer is a discrete state machine, writes Turing, a machine which moves by sudden jumps or clicks from one quite definite state to another. Discreteness is fundamental to the computer and to the digital in general. For Turing, the machine and human can be distinguished as long as they're conveniently defined 
as discrete entities. Turing immediately adds, though, in the same essay, that strictly speaking, there are no such machines. Everything moves continuously. Nothing is discrete. Writing does not employ discrete symbols, although its outcomes may be read in this way. In other words, I, I, may, produce, I, may, I may produce an outcome that has discrete symbols. The writing machine is not a discrete apparatus in Turing's sense. Ink bleeds into the paper. The computer overheats and sheds light and loses data. So in other words, computers aren't discrete machines. They exist in narrowly controlled thermal ranges. The website for Intel Corporation, which is the designer of many of the world's computer microprocessors, um, I think it's no longer, yeah, it is the chip inside here. The microprocessor inside this computer states that thermal management, thermal management refers to two major elements, a heat sink properly mounted to the processor and effective airflow through the system chassis. The ultimate goal of thermal management is to keep the processor at or below its maximum operating temperature. The computer is not dis discrete. It's not differentiated. It's a radiated sun in a constant state of decay. Using a computer is handling the decay and dispersal of thermal management. My point here is the, that we need to understand computers as m matter in a constant, uh, kind of tight, uh, narrowly controlled, barely controlled state of decay and radiation and not as discrete devices in the sense that the digital might suggest. There's no discrete. There are series, though. There are series that drift and distribute. And there is de dreamed and delirious communication between series. Rather than a simple distinction of computer and machine in the Turing test and its transposition to CAPTCHA, human positions in the apparatus are heterogeneous and wayward. There are at least four positions for the subject of the net in the Turing apparatus and in CAPTCHA. And at least two differential writing series across these four positions. Certainly, there's the computer that fails the test and does not recognize the image. That's the, the notion of differentiating computer from human. There's also the threatening Blade Runner-esque replicant computer that passes the Turing or Voight comp test and requires ever more sophisticated capture programs. Right? The, the, you know, even though they talk about the test being about distinguishing computer from machine, clearly there are different kinds of machines, some that indeed pass the test. There are humans that pass the test. And this means, and, and we all pass the test whenever we cap recognize a CAPTCHA and type it in, we pass that test, right? And this means, passing the test means not only recognize the image, but affirming this recognition and answering to the desire or call of the program. Because I might not answer. That is, there could also be a human that recognizes but doesn't respond and refuses to rewrite or write something other altogether. I might recognize the CAPTCHA and type something completely different. There's nothing stopping me doing that. I might be human. I, now, I might also be human but not recognize the image. Now, this could be a problem of ability. The World Wide Web Consortium, which keeps track of um, web standards, right, the W3, points out that the ubiquity of CAPTCHA and the reliance on visual images presents a major problem to users who are blind or have low vision or have a learning disability, such as dys dyslexia. Suggested alternatives include logic puzzles that would be unsolvable by computers but still recognizable by disabled users. Sound output of the sort already implemented with mixed success at Google and Hotmail. If you see those little disabled icons on Google and Hotmail, if you mouse over that, the computer will speak the CAPTCHA, right? SWM, yeah, and you, you have to recognize it, right? And also, um, another proposal is non-interactive checks that use system-wide measures to identify spam and other threats, rather than preventing those threats at the point of posting or signing up for an account. Now, what, what's clear in, in the um, argument for standards for disability with things like CAPTCHA is the philosophical claim of CAPTCHA. The, te you know, the claim that what, what it's after is a kind of essential humanness, right? Because the technologists designing CAPTCHA truly want to make it accessible to all who have this humanness without regard to ability. The attention is to separate ability or disability on the one hand, questions of ability or disability, from being human on the other. Any human should be able to pass the CAPTCHA in this notion. Now, it does remain the case that certain disabilities will still prevent a human from passing the test. Similarly, I might recognize the CAPTCHA but make a mistake in typing, right? My hands are perhaps shaking from too much whiskey or my keyboard is malfunctioning. In any case, I can retake the test, right? I can say, I can press a button and get another CAPTCHA to come up. I can call forth another CAPTCHA. So CAPTCHA doesn't claim to exclude. It wants me to manifest my humanness. The test solicits this display. In typing the caption into the text into the online form, I meet the other's desire. I give it what it wants, not the rewritten nonsense text. The computer doesn't want the nonsense text. Now, the recapture process, as I said, leverages that, but the basic moment of the capture where I type it in, the computer doesn't want the nonsense text, but it wants the con confirmation that a human act of recognition occurs. In responding, I signify that I am capable of promising 
capable of regulating myself in accordance with a protocol. Being human is tied to this promising. But what is recognition anyway? I can recognize this, and, and this is a large problem of, of image processing and pattern recognition, but let me say that I can recognize the string, and I could type something else, right? I, I could do that. Nothing stops me doing it. Why should I respond to a capture? I could respond with my own text. I can refuse every capture I encounter. As a result, I will exclude myself from the net. I won't be welcomed onto it. I exit from its domain. I refuse to meet the desire of the website. We might find this useless in, in Von Ahn's sense, but the point I'm trying to make is that, th that, being, that the notion that in order to be human, I have to rewrite the test and respond in a certain way is not, is not necessarily the only way to, that, that the thing functions. It means I would refuse to answer the desire of the net I would refuse to be confirmed in my humanness. I would put myself in a parallel position to the inauthentic replicant or the transgressing computer that passes the test through some, not the same position, but a parallel position, that passes the test through some sophisticated optical recognition software. Now bring to mind the, the also the, here in the background. Excuse me. Bring to mind the well-established gender critique of Turing's work. And actually, before I go to the, that, here's an example of what I mean. Here's a Dilbert cartoon. I don't know if you can see it. Dilbert says, the security audit accidentally locked out all the developers out of the system. Well, it is what it is. What? How does that help? You don't know what you don't know. Congratulations, you're the first human to fail the Turing test. What does that mean? Um, it is what it is? Why didn't you say that in the first place? Um, and you know, here we've got Dilbert, of course they're geeks, they know about the Turing test. We have the question, can a human fail the Turing test? And also this question of, what is it to fail the Turing test? Right? It is what it is, what, what it, and, and the idea again also that in order to pass the test requires um, articulating myself, and, um, and, but also a kind of inarticulation of what it would mean not to pass the test. So, okay. Bring to mind the well-established critique of the gender complex at work in Turing's test. Turing doesn't hide this. He announces from the first that he bases his test on a parlor game where the goal is to distinguish the gender of another only by means of written notes. It is the gender difference that Turing's game plays on, a difference already assumed by the time of the test. I must add gender difference and sexual differentiation as the condition of a body of your own. Consider the latest iteration of Von Ahn's game. Uh, you know, I talk about Von Ahn inventing this guap game where you label images. His latest version is what he calls a gender guesser, where um, it will guess your gender based on how you <coughs> label the images. He claims if you, um, after, I think, five or ten guesses, he'll be able to tell what gender you are. Or consider Naur's initial proposals. And these are, remember, I, I talked about Moni Naur's um, essay that originally proposed doing um, uh, capture-like text recognition. And he proposes a number of type of tests that would determine if you're human um, and he proposes a series of uh, tests before he arrives at the idea of the capture type rewriting a text. And some of these include uh, gender recognition, um, finding body parts, deciding nudity. This is looking at a picture and deciding if a person's nude or not. Right? I guess the question is whether a computer can do that. Um, and a series of other tests of this sort, all of which, all of which, in all of which are based on performative protocols of the civilized and sexed and gendered body and which the computer is presumed not to possess and the, com and the human presumed necessarily to possess. Now, if we link in also the problem of Turing's own sexuality, his, his homosexuality, the resulting institutional reaction to that, including the enforced drug treatments of Turing and his eventual suicide, or, or perhaps suicide, perhaps murder, and you see a libidinal apparatus here in the Turing test that cites and organizes the body in order to produce. Uh, here I think also of Jean-Francois Lyotard in thinking about what makes the machine think, what makes the machine start thinking. Lyotard argued sexual difference. Difference, um, human intelligence can go on without a material body, but not without the differential embodiment of libidinal fields with folds and drifts that cluster as organs, partial object choices and sexes. What does the field produce? It produces an utterance that will be its own name. I do not assume a persona in login, there's no dissimulation of intensities. They're, they are there or not. It's not that the thinking subject's sexuality is con conditioned by this differentiation. Rather, our differentiation 
is nothing other than the sexuality. The test writes out this difference. It constantly tests and retests singularity by naming and labeling. Now, I'm going to talk now, in, in conclusion, about two what I call writing series. I talked about the four, the different positions of the subject in relation to this test, right? I, I could retype it or not retype it, uh, and so on. I'm going to talk about two writing series involved here. The first writing series is circulating names. And I remember, this is the writing series. When it, earlier, when I spoke of uh, the net as a discrete space where uh, everything is purified on the net, I talked about um, the, 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 the way Unix executes a dot .login file that, in, in, um, and the net is always on. This is the space of circulating names. Logon is a state or modality of being on the net, deals with names. An object is an object on the net because it is named or addressable. This is a fundamental condition of the net. It follows the command shells of Unix and other operating systems where the environment is nothing more or less than uh, manipulations of names. The simple ls command in Unix gives powerful and direct access to the structure of the Unix environment. To operate in Unix requires a combination of knowing the proper or true name of an object and possessing the necessary permissions. Logon is a particular entry into this realm of names. In Logon, I leave a trace readable as an autobiographical name. This trace is more or less a signifier. If Logon is part of a symbolic system, it is notice noticeably split between the username and the password. So, so there's, there's a, a visible, uh, I'm going to talk at, at, to some degree about the visible part of logon, which is my username, but there's also the password. And logon signify, it, it, the, this split um, is signified in logon, this split between username and password. Anyone can have my username. It's an exchangeable token. It's a given name for my sysadmins, right? It's mine because I give it away. I can tell you, I mean, S. Baldwin, there's my, you, you got it, go with it. The net gives me this name and confirms me in this, with this name, and for this reason I can give it away to you or anyone. The basic symbolic economy of users is construed on these exchanges. Usernames correspond to accounts on the net to sites of data. The exchange of names is potential access to those sites as both the social networking, as the social network of power of Web 2.0 and spam attest. And I'm, I'm, I'm moving towards the end here. So. To hide a secret such as a password, I can write it down. I can secrete it physically under a rock or beneath the ground or within my memory or tattoo it on my scalp. Nothing is hidden in this way on the net. Everything in the environment is written and exists through writings and in a net of writings. Unix is a file system. And most of the you know, net largely works on versions of Unix. The operating environment is run by files and is itself as an environment a representation of the organization and movement through the file system. This means that Unix is a space of text with rules of access and exclusion also determined by text. The Unix shell dot password file is a collection of information about user passwords. Typically, another encrypted shadow file also stores personal information about users. This shadow file is less accessible, perhaps only to sysadmins, but is yet another writing within the net of writings. With every cycle, this text and all the others are rewritten by the net. In Unix, a file called the login log stores failed login attempts. In fact, it's only after five unsuccessful attempts that it begins to store attempted logins. So if I lo try to log into a site and fail five times, it starts to create a, a, a file called the login file that stores my attempts. The first five attempts are soon to be mistakes that I just kind of forgot how to type my password or um, lapses on my part. But after five attempts, the failures are soon to be intentional that I'm trying to hack into the site. And the system begins to record the attempts in a login log. It writes a file of the attempts, a growing text of ill-formed logins. It records login names, records TTY specifications, which is the, the terminal or computer I'm logging in from, and it, and it records the time of the login attempt. This log is related to server logs, which provide histories of requests to servers over the net. Every action we do on the net is recorded. Right? The W3 has standards for server logs, and everything we do, every time we access a website, it's recorded in a server log. And these files can be mined for information. Right? You get a hold of a server log, and you can mine it for information about who logs in what and where. And um, the login log goes beyond the server log. It records the complete text of my failed login attempts. Of course, there's the possibility of purposeful failure. This relates to my, the possibility of purposeful failure in, in copying the, t the capture text. A creative failure, psychotic refusal to log in, a refusal to meet the desire of the other, refusal to prevent my papers. I can offer the, the login, I can offer the system babble and nonsense. I can produce a hidden text I will never see. I'll never see the login log, but which is a stored kernel of myself vis-a-vis -vis the system. This literary possibility is fundamental to log in, and there are also parallels with this, this practice of what we might call malfeasant login, 
with artistic practices that intervene in proper modes of logging. For example, I'm thinking of Joseph DeLapp's uh, Logging into America's Army for his Dead in Iraq project. You might be familiar with that. Or um, Annie Abrams' Being Human, which is an internet uh, art site which, which explores different modes of logging in as, as uh, explorations of online being. So I log, in, I log on and write a text. And my point here is it may or may not be recorded. It may just disappear. Every time I log in, I type in S. Baldwin. I type in my password. If I do it right, that text just disappears. The text grows. I add to it daily. It's a virtual text. It's characterized by repetition and aggregation. It's iterative and spaced, a rhythm occurring in certain moments and certain hours, for certain times, for certain durations. The log on text, if we could read it, would go like this. Username, password, username, password, username, password, or S. Baldwin, star, 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 star. S. Baldwin, star, 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 which is a starred text, a secret and private zone of the password. Um, already a text of depths and inventions of bodies and codes, and the asterisks, the, those marked out asterisks of the password when you log in. And we've all seen this, right? You see a login screen, you type in your password, and it's, it's maybe it's an asterisk, maybe it's blotted out, right? Those are cross-cut from my interior, right? Because I, I, you know, I know what they are, even though they're asterisks. They're, it's like the eruption of something from inside onto the surface of the screen. The password's closer to me than the username. I've talked about the username. Now the password's closer to me than the username. You recognize <coughs> the password's part of the login text. It's there even deeper than the username. It's past the, perhaps the most important part. I can give you my username. It's nothing but a, a severed object without the password. It takes both to log on, but the password is deeper and closer. The username is discourse, name given to me by others. Mine because I can give it away. The password's different. An effective password, that's one both memorable and unguessable, is held within, inaccessible to prying eyes or rather it appears as nothing but asterisks that burn with interiority. And again, you, you may, I hope you grasp that I'm suggesting the phenomenon of capture that I showed is related to the phenomenon of the password and the login name. All of this, keep in mind, login, capture, all this is played out in a visible field, right? When you sit and log in at your terminal in a computer lab, if I stand at your shoulder and watch, I'll see your username, but I won't see your password, right? It's encrypted and asterisked out. So in the visual field, it's, it's not there. And of course, say, say I'm doing that, I'm sitting there and you're sitting at my shoulder watching. Uh, now it's possible that you're very quick, you're able to remember the sequence of my fingers on the keyboard, you can try to occupy my movements, inhabit my fingers as they dance on the keys, but you'll never grasp the non-visible and hidden field of recognition I share with the machine, it's, which is at most a kind of blot, right, the eraser of the encryption of these asterisks. But I know that, and the net knows, this non-visible domain of correctness. I and the net can look through the asterisks to see the password I give. I, I'm trying to point out a, a paradox here. I type something that I don't see. If you were to look at it, you wouldn't see it. It would just be asterisks. But I know what it is. The net knows what it is. The net even tells me if it's correct or not. So there's a different domain here at work. To reach this domain requires perversion. For the screen as a place and the computer as a thing, to identify with the image, to channel my pleasure into its recognition, I must perversely give myself to the net's desire. I mean, isn't this the very this and this deviation, the very definition of perversion. I have to modulate my desire and myself in desire, in writing to the other's desire. I mean, it's a simple point of perversion. In other words, I can't type, if I want to be on the net, I can't type just anything. I must type this very specific thing, right? I, 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 if I type something else, the, the net will say, sorry, Bob, I can't get on. So I must type what it wants. What difference would it make for me to add my password? I could write it up here on the screen or I could replace the asterisk with a string of characters and put it into discourse. To do so involves a sort of exposure, right? How many of you want to tell me your passwords to all your account? You don't, right? It, it, it feels a little indecent. It's a bit like dropping your drawers. I don't share it with you, it's too intimate. It requires letting you in on my perverse relationship to the net. Yet, I've already assumed that position with the system. I'm already perversely displayed. The network knows my password, knows it so well that it, it can encrypt it visibly, showing only the string of asterisks. The net not only knows it, but is waiting for it, providing a text box for me to insert my password. I meet the net's expectations. We exchange something that only appears as asterisks or stars. The net knows what I want, and I know what it wants. It desires nothing but this sharing. This means I could tell you my password, and who would you have to be, and what would it take for me to do that? And you could assume my position in relation to the net, but you could never assume the position of the net. You could take my spot and touch the keys and give the net what it wants, you could create the phenomena of login in my place, the visibility of the username in the star text, guaranteeing that in that other place of the net, you are on for me, you are me for it. 
The scene of the logon is obscene. Before any recognition, there must be a surface with holes. Right? You know, we're familiar with these boxes, these holes in the screen, that are different from other things. Some things on the screen I can press or click, but these are holes that I put stuff into. There's a box, an empty field I fill in. We're well trained to know where these punctuations and openings are on the screen. We recognize them as holes, no longer surface, but entry points, orifices. And, and there's a whole topology of interjection here. Um, and I, I would argue that this, this um, is transcendent to or prior to questions of interface design and interactive elements. In other words, um, before we talk about questions of uh, spacing and so on on the screen, there's a primary question of the opening on the screen versus the surface of the screen. The screen must have a depth, it must have a place where I put something, I enter my username or password into that depth, but it cannot be filled, it remains hungry, right? What am I filling when I log into, right? And we can, and here the, 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 the interjective topology I'm talking about start, starts to be organized in terms of a body, right? Is it, is it, a, is it a mouth, is it, a, is it another genital, is it a genital, is it an organ? Hole in the screen must be the rim, it's a rim of an orifice, right? We have, we, we're familiar with a range of rimmed orifices, right? And given that I've identified it with perversity, it could be different rimmed orifices, right? It could range from ear to nose to anus and so on. But the orality of logon dominates. I'm gonna, I would argue if I pursued this, the orality of logon dominates, right? Because you're feeding the screen. You release the, and, but th this would be an interesting debate, and I'm still pursuing this. Which means then the, 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 we, we have a kind of face here. Whose face? Now there's a crowd here just as there is at every interface. There's always a crowd of faces. The space is no one, it's the face of the system. It alone takes my name and it alone sees the password. The sysadmin can check my password. The person who runs the system, I forget my password, I can say, well, what's my password? And they can check. But it's, they're not the one who see it, it's every time I log on. They're privileged, it's true, but only for a glimpse of what's always before the gaze of the net. Um, and, and so, um, I'm arguing for this kind of um, almost generic phase here. The content of the other's desire, whether password or captcha text, is smoothed and voided and enigmatic. It is exorbitant communication with this second writing series, and this is where I conclude. Not the exchange of names, but bodily display. The condition of uh, these intense sites, the condition of this frantic resistance or drive, resistance or drive to log on, what do I offer the computer? And this is where I conclude. I sacrifice, I offer, I display, I make my body a sign. And you can list the offerings to the computer. Um, certainly in recognizing the capture or typing the password, we offer our gaze, we offer the weight of hands, our hands on the keyboard or mouse, breathing, movement, the flow of heat, um, all expended absolutely at the interface. And we're not used to thinking of the machine in this level. We're thinking of the we're used to thinking of the machine as a social object, as a projection machine automatically displaying images that takes us somewhere else, as in, where do you want to go today? Machine evokes the order of steam engines or industrial devices. The computer screen and mic microprocessors are fundamentally static surfaces, at least to our perception. The automaticity of display and topology of the screen as interjected um, um, surface of uh, projection and intensity um, I, I argue are all part of what we mean when we call the computer a machine. I'm thinking of squeezing the mouse. I'm thinking of giving it the movements of my hand and arm. What else? Heat of my body, pressure and weight of the hands and the keyboard, breath, inhalations, exhalations. Um, I perhaps I'll offer more. I may carry the laptop with me and hug it close. I may offer it the curvature of my chest and leg. I may enter into the erotics of net sex. I may lick the screen. There's a range of things. But let me be clear. As I sit before the computer, all that matters all that I can offer it at the, in this bodily series, and I'm contrasting it to the, the writing series of the exchange of names in the virtual domain, this other writing series, this other series of inscriptions, all that I can offer at this point is pressure and, and, and the weight of my body and the heat of my body. This is all that can be materially communicated. There's no economic exchange at work. I don't exchange these parts for offering from the computer. All of my offers are in tempted couplings. The couplings, I, I don't mean it in terms of net sex. I think that's too far. It, that, it, that's, that it's not yet at that point. But there, there's uh, these, these uh, attempted couplings that are both below and before the net, but relations to the computer nonetheless, offered with no hope of response, right? No response at all. At the level of sacrifice the computer takes and gives nothing in return, it remains a surface and contour for my offerings, my, and a surface, how my fingers fit the keyboard, the ergonomics involved code my body offering, my hands grab the mouse, all of these coded in terms of computer, human-computer interactions, but I, I ask that we think of it in terms of this um, 
inscription series, the sacrificial inscription series, where I give and give. All is pushed forward in the time of my body in the presence of the computer, where I offer and shed and present these fluids and residues for the real time of my body. And here's the last paragraph. Uh, pause for a moment and marvel at this expenditure, the sacrifice given to the screen, the energy, the attention, the devotion, all of this nameless, forgotten, and absorbed. Is not Logon a problem of this fuzzy, messy interface of sacrifice and simulacrum, of communicating series of names in the, in the virtual domain and bodies in the real domain, at the scene of rewriting and iteration of CAPTCHA and the Turing test? There's no recognition but intensity and display and ostentation of this excessive giving, not the confirmation of unique subjectivity and identity, but the after effect of an apparatus that converts intensity into productivity. Thank you.